you guys confirmed your 2020 guidance and said on the call that you are expecting to see health systems and major markets kind of starting to come back online for things other than COVID-19 in the second quarter. Are you anticipating a second wave in the fall? Tell us about how you're looking at the year ahead. Yeah, Meg, you know, great to be here with you. And we were really excited to see our first quarter results. You saw we had very strong sales and core operating income growth, uh, partially helped by the COVID pandemic, but uh, stocking. But if you really look at it, even independent of that very strong performance. When we look at the dynamics in healthcare systems, I think it's very important for patients and providers that we start to get to a normal rhythm. Because one of the hidden costs of this pandemic is patients that need really important care are not getting that care. So our belief is that in our conversations with healthcare systems around the world that there is a desire for those systems to get patients back in, really try to come up with creative ways to manage the risks with respect to, to the pandemic, but make sure those patients get that care that they need. So we're optimistic that can happen in the Q2 time period. Now, in terms of future waves, hard to know, of course, but our, we're optimistic that with all of the knowledge that we've generated on how, on how to treat this virus, how to track the virus, how to take public health measures, that future waves can be managed uh, hopefully better than the first wave to limit the impact on healthcare systems. And certainly part of the hope for being able to wave uh, to manage future waves better will be to have effective treatments. And Novartis has several uh, that you are running clinical trials on now. And you just announced a new one today of canakinumab, which is an immunomodulatory drug where you'll be running trials. Um, that one is a similar approach to what we saw yesterday from Regeneron, a slightly different target, but still going after that immune response that causes that lung inflammation. What's your expectation on the um, outlook for that, given the sort of mixed results we saw yesterday? Yeah, I think first, it's, it's, a, high, it's a high bar to find uh, effective medicines from repurposed drugs. We know that. But this, of course, is a situation where we need to do everything possible to help patients in the hospital or in the ICU and all of the frontline workers who I think are working tirelessly to try to manage these patients and, and help the healthcare systems cope. What we believe is that looking at multiple ways of tackling that uh, severe cytokine storm that we're seeing in patients in the ICU is prudent. And it's important to do that with very rigorous trials. I commend the other sponsors of the anti-IL-6 studies, which you mentioned. We believe anti-IL-1 acts further upstream, so perhaps it can uh, impact the, the cytokine storm a little bit uh, broad, more broadly and hopefully mitigate the, the impact this is having on patients. With the JAK inhibitor, we have a similar hope. But I think the most important thing for everyone right now is to wait for the results of the adequately powered, randomized, double-blind, uh, controlled studies that will come out over the coming months. There's a lot of studies reading out, but the ones that matter are those gold standard studies. And that will tell us whether we have something in this first wave of repurposed medicines. And then, of course, there's going to be future technologies as well we can, we can look at. Uh, Vaz, hi, it's, it's John Fort. Um, there is a proposal floating out there to freeze M&A activity for large companies during this crisis. We were just talking to FTC Commissioner Noah Phillips about it moments ago. Novartis, I believe, just completed an acquisition last week, uh, Ambliotech. What would you think of a proposal like that to freeze M&A activity, and what would its effect be on you? Well, I, I think it's important to look, uh, of course, first at different sectors with the appropriate lens. I mean, my, you know, when you look at healthcare and you look at, uh, you know, our sector, pharmaceuticals, we're in a healthy financial state. We're taking care of our employees. We're contributing to the pandemic uh, response. So I think, you know, we we have the opportunity to, of course, continue to look at business development, the, the development licensing um, and M and A. That said, we also need to be responsible corporate uh, citizens. So if in the end it's determined that the best approach from the U.S. government or other regulators is to limit M&A, we, of course, would abide by it. But we feel at this moment we can do very prudent business development activity that's done in a financially responsible way that serves innovation with technologies like Ambliotech or the innovation we recently acquired in glycerin for cholesterol lowering and get those medicines to patients faster and more broadly. How much are you worried about or thinking about uh, the degree to which advances come vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the coronavirus and nations fight over uh, the early promises where nationalism has a, a detrimental effect on global public health? 
So I think this is a, an important consideration, but I'm optimistic when I look at some of the, pro, the all of the great collaboration happening now across the industry, whether it's the uh, Gates COVID accelerator that we're currently working on uh, with a range of different sponsors, which uh, and, and biopharmaceutical companies, which really works across geographies to get manufacturing scale, research scale, development scale. We have similar initiatives in Europe as an industry we're trying to take a very global perspective. And so hopeful we can overcome uh, some of the nationalism that has happened in the past during the H1N1 pandemic, where I was uh, involved very heavily. There were moments where there was nationalism to hold vaccine supply. I think this is a moment where if we get an, a good therapeutic or we get a good vaccine, we need to ensure broad access to populations around the world. Well, it's an important question. And of course, one drug that's had a ton of attention is hydroxychloroquine. Novartis is donating 130 million doses of hydroxychloroquine, but you're also running a controlled clinical trial. Um, tell us about how you would assess the data you've already seen on that drug. Um, and is it difficult to run this controlled trial when the drug is already being used so widely in treatment? Look, Meg, these are, these are great questions. I think the first thing for all of the listeners to understand is there's a range of studies reading out. But again, the design of studies matter, the patient populations matter, the dosing matters. All of these are important factors. But the design is paramount. Do we have randomization? Are we double-blinded? Are we adequately powered? That's the gold standard that regulators use to determine if a drug works or not. We've had very few studies like that. So most of the studies on hydroxychloroquine are indicative of perhaps some benefit in some populations, a lack of benefit in other populations. But the truth is we simply don't know. So our goal was to run a study that would be adequately powered, endorsed by FDA in hospitalized patients, 440 patients, randomized to hydroxychloroquine, hydroxychloroquine plus azithromycin, an antibiotic, or best standard of care powered appropriately, double-blinded across the United States to see if this drug can really have uh, an impact. Now, we are concerned about our ability to enroll, but I think overall we're still optimistic we can get those 440 patients on therapy. We're also supporting about 13 investigator-initiated studies, as well as major national registries, such as in Switzerland or in Spain, that are just trying to track the use of the medicine and get us more data.